Good evening, everyone. It's August 12th. Today we'll talk about Howl's Moving Castle that was aired on TV the day before yesterday. Yes, I had a haircut. Now, I look like the chairman of the Boxing Association. Or a Yakuza. I was so ashamed of my new hairdo, like Howell, and didn't want to be filmed. But then I thought, I'd give it a try. Tonight, we'll talk about the film featured in Friday Roadshow the other day, Howl's Moving Castle. I didn't think I'd talk about this film, but let's get on with it. So, the reference books. The most famous one is Alberto Robita's The 20th Century. Hayao Miyazaki had always said that he wanted to make a film adaptation of this book. He's a Paris-based painter in the 19th century, or more like an illustrator or a novelist. He predicted the 20th century in a very humorous way. And the other book is a bit easier to read. It's called Future Days by Isaac Asimov, and the foreword is by Shotaro Ishinomori. I recommend these two books to those of you who are interested in films like Howl's Moving Castle or the works made during the Raputa Castle in the Skies era. Other than that, of course, basically we have Ghibli's textbook series published by Buge Shunju. Two or three days before, Ghibli's textbook, The Tale of the Princess Kaguya, was released. In it, Ghibli producer Toshio Suzuki wrote endlessly about why he never wanted to work with Isao Takahata ever again, and it's the best part. I don't know if this will help you understand the Kaguya story, but I was impressed with how a person could be so brutally attacked after death. This series is a must read. And the original novel, Howl's Moving Castle, written by Diana Wynne Jones. Compared to the original, no, compared to the anime version, the original novel depicts Howe's inner clumsiness more accurately. And the Roman album of the magazine Animeju. They're always interesting to read, but the one about Howe's moving castle had too many drawings and few interviews, so I wasn't quite happy with it. But you can't miss this because originally Ghibli was owned by Tokuma Shoten and albums or magazine books published by Tokuma go through severe checking. I personally think if the publications of Ghibli were the number one source, the publications of Tokuma should be the number 1.5 source. So, the terms I use here are mostly based on the Roman album published by Tokuma. And lastly, this is a storyboard of the Howl's Moving Castle. You've just got to buy this. You'll notice a lot more details by looking at it. And that makes a huge difference. So, if you're not satisfied with the Miyazaki film, you should look at the storyboard. Today, we'll look at the storyboard and talk about the film step by step. Howl's Moving Castle was aired the day before yesterday, but before that, The Girl Who Leapt Through Time and The Boy and the Beast were aired two weeks in a row, both Mamoru Hosoda's films. Originally, Hosoda was assigned to direct Howl's Moving Castle as his debut film. You can still see some of his drawings 
It was drawn for Ghibli's film Howl's Moving Castle, and it is labeled Part A. And it's about two thirds of the whole thing. Hosoda claims that he was sacked. While Miyazaki says the crew ran away, that they broke up, whereas Suzuki never gave a clear answer. So it remains unclear. I was interested in Hosoda's version, so I expanded the storyboard to see how he did it. And when you look at it, it's set in the modern world. You can see a modern car parked in front of Sophie's shop. And Sophie wears glasses. She wears glasses while working, and she's struggling to find her own path. And it's not bad at all. It might have been more interesting to set it in the modern world. Because this piece... Uh, I describe this piece as Ghibli's first mop-up picture film. Because it was unpopular in Europe. In France, an art exhibition featuring Spirited Away was so popular that people flooded in. And Ghibli advertised Howl's Moving Castle during that time. However, compared to The Princess Mononoke and Spirited Away, Howl's Moving Castle was unpopular. Well, slightly unpopular. The reason for that is because it wasn't a story about Japan. Europeans wanted to see the modern Japan through Hayao Miyazaki's lens. They felt let down by an imitation of Western culture. Miyazaki was very disappointed by this response. Since Hosoda's version was set in the modern world, maybe things would have been different if they had adopted his version. Even Miyazaki wasn't sure whether he should take it to Europe. For instance, he didn't know what to do in the first scene where Sophie goes to town. In Europe, in the 19th and early 20th century, women never moved their arms or shoulders. So he made her walk with her upper body still. But that made her look a bit cold. So he decided to make her walk like modern Japanese people with both of her arms loose. But eventually, some people actually complain to Miyazaki's chagrin. I wish Ghibli published the whole storyboard of Hosoda's version, but Ghibli's so strict about disclosing this information. Next opportunity will be when Miyazaki dies, and the last opportunity will be when the producer Suzuki dies. Oh, we don't have time for all this. Miyazaki's version of Howl. Well, it's more like the finalized version of Howl. When I saw it for the first time, I mean, this is the impression I got when I saw it the other day. But Howl is basically Miyazaki's alter ego. So, like the comedian Sugi-chan, he's like, I'm wild, on the surface. But Miyazaki is vulnerable inside, and the scary witch, Madame Suleiman, is Takahata. Takahata who treats people like things. Whereas Sophie is like Miyazaki's wife. People say that the reason why Miyazaki goes home, no matter how busy he is, is because his wife is waiting for him at home. Well, that's what I think. We'll talk about this in the second half. First, I must talk about... He's a devoted husband? Ah, oh, well, if you hear my lecture to the end, you'll understand what I mean. He's not a devoted husband in the ordinary sense, but it is obvious that he is a devoted husband in his own unique way. This Howl's Moving Castle had mixed reviews, almost for the first time in Ghibli history. Some people were moved, but some people complained. 
At this point of his career, Miyazaki began to believe that animation was for kids, and it should be fun and filled with hope. This was something he believed firmly. But, at the same time, he wanted to make a film that was bittersweet and allowed adults to reflect on their lives. So, he created a story with two layers. Kids see it as a fun story with a happy ending, while the adults see it as a bittersweet story that touches their hearts. You can see this double structure in Miyazaki's latter films. His early films like Naushika of the Valley of the Wind or Princess Mononoke had two characters with different views confront each other. It's like the idea of communist revolution that Takahata loves. Miyazaki adopted thesis, antithesis, synthesis into his story. So, Princess Mononoke is a story about a conflict between the world of Mononoke and the human world and shows the impossibility of their coexistence. Just around the time he made Spirited Away, the double structure emerged. When there's a conflict, it is difficult to end the story with a happy ending. So technically, it was really difficult for Miyazaki to accomplish that. He made it look like a happy ending by having her parents come back at the end. But at the same time, he makes us wonder why Chihiro came back from the world of the dead. So it has a double structure. But in his last film, The Wind Rises, he dumps everything he did in the past and squeezes in everything he has to say. So he entered a wild phase, so to speak, which I kind of like. But Howl's Moving Castle has a double structure. The upper layer is completely for women, a romantic love story. So it satisfies all the ladies looking for a love story. And in the end, Sophie gets her dream house. So it's a complete happy ending. But for some people, this happy ending doesn't make any sense. Some people say that it's too good. So, like I said, the upper layer, it seems like a typical romantic love story for girls. But if you look at the deeper layer, it's a story about a middle-aged man on the verge of old age. So he denies all hopes and romanticism of men. He lays out his own hypothesis and it's quite interesting. Maybe the word upper layer wasn't right. Maybe it's more like the left layer or the right. The romance in this story is hard to understand. So it makes sense to people who are more familiar with love stories. They're able to enjoy it and say, yes, that is so true. But those who aren't used to these kinds of stories get confused and say, I don't understand these people. At the same time, you need to understand the bittersweet aspect of this story. Otherwise, you'll be bored. It is quite interesting if you understand both sides of the story. So today I will explain it to you thoroughly. Of course, it's also interesting to see it as a pure love story and see Miyazaki's girly side. So I'd like to break it down because it's hard for us men to understand because we're not as feminine as Miyazaki. Many male viewers think that the story isn't interesting enough, or they say that the line at the ending, I am a prince from the neighboring country, is such a cliché. As a matter of fact, Miyazaki's Howl's Moving Castle is so meticulously designed 
that it's like perfectly made Lego. It's anything but a cliche. It might be hard to believe, but every single detail in this film is meticulously calculated. That nothing happens by coincidence. The reason why it's so hard to grasp is because we see the whole film from Sophie's point of view. For example, what would happen if you see the castle of Cogliostro from Clarice's point of view? Take a look at this. Cogliostro is a simple story, but what happens if you see it from Clarice's point of view? First, she leaves the convent, and she's forced to marry a dirty man. So she runs away in a car. She causes a car accident and is locked into a tower. A thief tries to rescue her, but he's caught in a trap. As she cries, her home teacher Fujiko breaks a window. The thief comes and rescues her again, but he is threatened with death, so she decides to surrender and marry the dirty old fellow. She's forced to take a pill and loses consciousness. When she wakes up, she's wearing a wedding dress and the thief gets killed right in front of her. She screams, but he is actually alive. She runs away with the thief, but gets caught again. The thief is threatened with death again. So she dives into the lake to save him. At dawn, Interpol comes. The thief is horrified and runs away. She begs him to take her with him, but the answer is no. She realizes that she is in love. So when you look at it from Clarice's point of view, it's all very messy. This is Clarice's point of view, but you can see how difficult it is to see a film from a certain perspective. You can't narrow it down to a single perspective. Um, it's hard to understand. So, Howl's Moving Castle is told from Sophie's point of view. So, you've got to pick up all the information that is coming at you. For example, uh, this is a bad example. Well, maybe it's not fair to say that, but you know the latest Evangelion 3.0, you cannot redo? The reason why it seems so complex is because it's depicted solely from Shinji Ikari's point of view. If they had written the story from several perspectives, the story would have been a lot easier to understand. When you narrow it down to a single perspective, it becomes extremely subjective and deep like some kind of literature. But in a case like this where you have only one narrator, once you stumble at any point, you're doomed. On top of this complexity, they hired the idol Takuya Kimura to voice act, which created more controversy. Like I said, Howl's Moving Castle is like the mop-up picture, but it was the second biggest hit in Ghibli history. Spirited Away is the first by a huge distance, but Howl comes in second. Suzuki would probably be furious at the term a mop-up picture, but Ghibli was having great success with The Princess Mononoke and Spirited Away, and was doing very well setting new records one after another. But for the first time, they stumbled, and this is a failure Suzuki doesn't want to admit. When Miyazaki announced his retirement, he was asked, what is your favorite work? And he immediately answered, I wouldn't say that it's my favorite, but Howl's Moving Castle is like a thorn that has stuck in me for years. So he's constantly bothered by this film. Many people misunderstand, but... Miyazaki tends to fight back when he's told that his story is a cliché or illogical. He says, some people say that my work is illogical or clichéd, but all films are clichéd and films needn't be logical. Well, this is more like the nonsense of a stubborn old man. 
Because Howl's Moving Castle is logical to the extreme. It blew me away when I did the analysis myself. It is logical inside and out. So, he meant to say, those of you who can't even see the logical side of it and complain that it's a complete failure have no right to see any films. He's like a sulky kid, so you shouldn't take his words too seriously. I wanted to talk about this film because it's actually a boy's film. Or you could say it's a film for middle-aged men and many people don't get that. I liken this to the last scene of the castle of Cagliostro, where Clarice says, take me with you, I'll learn how to be a thief. This film depicts what would have happened if Lupin had taken her with him. At the same time, it's also like Puella Magi Madoka Magica if you watch the last scene of the TV version. From a different perspective, it's almost like Howl's Moving Castle. I want you to know that Miyazaki actually did something quite amazing. Well, it's already 20 minutes, but I want to explain this as much as I can during the free part. If I go in story order, I end up revealing the secret in the second half. So, I'll show you the whole plan of this lecture right after this, during the first half. So, you can take a screenshot of today's plan for you to look at later. You'll see the flow of the second half by simply looking at it. Of course, for those of you who subscribe, I'll dig deeper in the second half, a lot deeper than you could possibly imagine. But I'll show you the whole plan during the first half. I'll show you the list of all the witches and wizards of Howl's Moving Castle and the plot. I'll speed up so try to keep up with me. This is the list of all the witches and wizards that appear in Howl's Moving Castle in order of appearance. So Howl himself is a bird. He's basically a bird. Sophie was able to go inside his castle because of the scarecrow stick. The handle of the stick is bird-shaped, and that is like a permit. Don't you think it's weird to show that stick up close? Calcifer was tricked, and that's how she gets in. So, Howl is basically a bird. The second witch is the Witch of the Waste. She's vulnerable to light. Witch of the Waste first appears in these two cuts. She's on a palanquin. Some people think that's because she's too fat to walk, but she just hates the light. That's why she has black curtains. She looks fat and ugly, but when she enters Sophie's shop in the dark, she's absolutely stunning. She's beautiful. Well, she's huge, but she's beautiful. But she gradually turns ugly as she goes up the stairs. You might think that's because she's tired of climbing and she's sweating, but no. There's a fixed law. This witch is vulnerable to light. She gets off the palanquin, and as she is forced to walk in the light and goes up the slope, she gradually loses her power. She ages, and at last, Suleiman tricks her to go inside the room with light bulbs. She's suddenly exposed to the light and loses her shade instantly. So, the Witch of the Waste loses her power. Every witch has their own weakness, and the second witch, Witch of the Waste, is vulnerable to light. The third wizard is the Scarecrow. This Scarecrow, in the last scene, the spell breaks and he turns into a prince. It seems a bit lame, but it's actually not. For example, 
There's a scene where he dries the laundry. He helps her dry the laundry. Both Markel and Sophie say that he likes laundry, and you almost believe that, but this isn't true. The scarecrow is actually looking at the mountains. He's longing to go back to his own country. That's why he stands on the high spot and looks at the mountains where his country is. He's always looking for an opportunity to become human again and go back to his home country. Now, why did he become a wizard? Here. This is a bit hard to understand, but it's the last scene where Madame Suleiman is looking into her crystal bowl. Sophie is waving her hands and the scarecrow, the prince of a neighboring country, goes back to his own country flying on a stick. The spell is already broken. How come he is still on a stick and flying? That's because he is a wizard himself. How can he be a prince and a wizard? In Hal's country, the king cannot use magical powers, so he uses science instead. And Suleiman is trying to train witches and wizards at her school. So, they have different systems. In the neighboring country, the prince is a wizard, and the king is also a wizard. It's a country founded by wizards. It's a magic kingdom and it has massive military strength. That's why Hal's country is trying to utilize science. It's like Marley in Attack on Titan. They're trying to compete against magical power by using science. That means... Someone must have turned him into a scarecrow. Of course, it's Hal's country who attacked the neighboring country. And it's probably Madame Suleiman. I'll explain it later. The fourth wizard is Marco, the boy who's always with Hal. I don't have much to say about him. He's an apprentice. Howl's Moving Castle is picking a fight with Disney's Fantasia in a way. The scene where the stars fall around the young Howl. It's almost exactly the same as the scene in Fantasia where the water fairies fly. It's almost like saying, hey, I'm better than you. When you look at the release date, Harry Potter and Fantasia were released roughly during the same period. He's competing against the traditional animation and trying to show the correct answer. He's also trying to compete with Harry Potter by saying, no, this is what real magic looks like. It's kind of cool how he picks a fight. He even shows his playful side with the character Marco, the wizard's apprentice. As soon as Miyazaki had Marco, Calcifer, and the dog in his storyboard, he said, the kids are gonna love this film. So, they're like mascots in a way. The fifth wizard is the flying monster. This is the monster with a silk hat who fights with Hal in the middle. Hal says to Calcifer, they're like low-ranking wizards. I bet they can't turn back into humans anymore. They're also wizards, so probably they're wizards from the Magic Kingdom. They've been under so many spells that they can't turn back into humans ever again. Since they're wearing silk hats, well, Howl is from Germany or a place called Kolmar or Strasbourg, the Alsace region near the border between France and Germany. This border moves once in 30 or 50 years. So this region moves within French and German territory. This is where the story is set because they use German in all the posters. I guess it's now in German territory. Whereas these creatures who come and attack wearing silk hats are probably from a country like Britain. 
Next, the dog, Heen. How can a dog be a wizard? When Miyazaki wrote the proposal of this film, he described this character as a human dog. <laughs> Madame Suleiman tells this dog to serve her for the rest of his life as her spy. I don't know if this is supposed to be a punishment, but at the end, when Heen laughs at Suleiman's blunder, she says, You unfaithful two timer! Suleiman uses the word unfaithful instead of the word traitor, which means that Suleiman basically considers all of her servants as her lovers. She treats her lovers. Uh, like puppets, makes them fall in love with her and exploits them. That's my personal opinion. So you can always sense this dark emotion in every scene. So why did he call it a human dog? There's a scene where Sophie climbs up the stairs with Heen, and he's extremely heavy. He's a lot heavier than she thought. That's because he's still a human, although he looks like a dog. That's why Sophie says, why are you so heavy? And lifts him up with all her strength. Miyazaki made this scene to reveal this secret. Instead of saying, you're heavy, she says, why are you so heavy? You can see the cruel side of Suleiman here. She turned a human into a dog to serve her for decades. Heen shows the cruel side of Suleiman, but you can also see the double structure here. It's typical of a woman's cruelty. But at the same time, kids love dogs, so Miyazaki knows exactly what he's doing. Madam Suleiman. Needless to say, Madame Suleiman is a witch. She's the principal of Royal Magic Academy and she's merciless. She's like Muska in Raputa, Castle in the Sky. The page boys of Madame Suleiman, well, those boys that look just like the young Howl, the servants around her, and the butlers, they're all dressed like the young Howl. You can see the erotic relationship between Suleiman and Howl. It's kind of messy in a way, and you should take notice, and it's not that Miyazaki was careless and made everyone look the same. He's saying there's something you might want to look into. <laughs> Lastly, Sophie. Not many people realize that Sophie is also a witch. As you know, I was really surprised. Miyazaki explains it with his drawing. This is the last scene. From the very first scene, when Sophie goes out, she always wears a straw hat, and there's a red ribbon on it. She always wears a red shawl too. It's a sign that she's always a young girl, even when she's old. But in the last scene, the ribbon suddenly turns black. Miyazaki has used black as a symbol of a witch since Kiki's delivery service. Miyazaki shows this clearly by drawing a black ribbon so that he doesn't have to explain. This is actually the proof. So there are nine different witches or wizards all together, including Sophie, so keep that in mind. How could I know? Uh, yes, people don't realize it. Miyazaki's films are so complex, it's all calculated. That's why they're so interesting. Now, oh, it's already 30 minutes, but I'll continue. I'm going to explain the story and the plot. I'll explain the difference. The story is usually the scenes laid out in order like the storyboard. They're in the right order. 
Whereas the plot is laid out based on cause and effect. So for the plot, the scenes are laid out according to a timeline, and the story focuses on how to present this. In Dragon Ball, Son Goku, raised by an old man in the countryside, meets Bulma, and they set out on a journey together. This is the story. The plot goes like this. A long time ago, there was a lost child of Ryu tribe on planet Namek. The good part of him became a god, and the bad part of him became the evil king Piccolo. Frieza, who dominates the universe, conquers the Saiyans. The Saiyans send Kakarot, who later becomes Son Goku. Plot is laid out based on time. The incident that happened before is always what triggers the next incident. So you can see the cause and effect. Story is more about how you present it. The rhythm of the story changes in the middle. There's part A, B, and C in this film, but usually Miyazaki's films end at part B. As you can see, there's two lines in part A, three lines in part B, four lines in part C. It goes on to part D and part E and goes on and on. At the end, the words can't fit in anymore. <laughs> The number of words grow towards the end. This is because when Miyazaki was making the storyboard, he realized that the individual cuts in part A were too long. They were 10 seconds each. When Suzuki asked him about this, he said, Damn, Sophie is so old and slow. I became slow as well. He couldn't change that anymore. So each cut is very long in part A and part B. But as you reach the second half, it gets much faster. That's because they were trying to get back to six seconds per cut. Each cut becomes shorter and shorter as you go along. So it speeds up. In part A, Sophie falls in love with Howl at first sight. She is turned into an old lady by the spell of the Witch of the Waste. In part B, she starts working as a cleaning lady at Howl's castle. Howl is summoned by the king. Howl is disappointed by the color of his hair. In part C, Howl is scared of both Suleiman and the Witch of the Waste, and he sends Sophie instead. When Sophie arrives at the palace, the Witch of the Waste turns into an old lady. Howl runs away from a magic fight. Sophie takes the dog and the old lady home. These are part A, B, and C, half of the story. Like I said, this story is told from Sophie's point of view. This is hard to see because Miyazaki at some point decided to cut all the scenes that have nothing to do with Sophie's romance. When you look at it closely, it's all there. But, for example, in the TV series Sana Damaru, all the scenes of Lord Nobunaga Oda's prime were cut out from the story. Those scenes were cut just because the protagonist, Nobushige Sanada, wasn't in them. Instead, the story covers the era of Nobunaga and the following years up to the summer siege of Osaka from Nobushige's point of view as he grows up to become a warlord. So if you don't have the basic knowledge of this period, it's hard to understand. And the suicide of Nobunaga is only described by the narrator. But in Howl's Moving Castle, there is not even a narration. For example, if the story is told only from Nobushige's girlfriend, Kiri's point of view, and just added some narration to it, Everything would seem so abrupt. The viewers would lose track of history, and everything would become oversimplified. That's what's happening here. Now, this is very important. Take a look at this. This is the plot of Howl's Moving Castle. It's not told in the film, but here it is. This plot will allow you to understand more about this film.
果関係ですね。はい。えー、っとですね。It's pretty long, but I'll read from the top. Let's look at the plot of Howl's Moving Castle according to the timeline. You can take screenshots if you want. The neighboring country is a kingdom founded by witches, a magic kingdom. Because the prince is a wizard, they have state of the art magic. Sophie's country competed with them using science, like Marley in Attack on Titans. Hal's uncle tries to finish writing a magic scroll, but dies. This is important. This means that when Sophie travels back in time to Hal's childhood, you see a paperweight here, and the paperweights are shaped like gun batteries and all the other things Hal loves. At first, I thought it was Hal's paperweight, but that doesn't make sense because back at that time, he's only like 10 years old, but it says unfinished draft on the desk. The draft means a manuscript that is set to be published, but that has not been published yet. So that means that this belonged to his deceased uncle. This scene is at the end of part E. This wizard uncle died before he was able to publish his book. It has not been published yet. So it's a draft. Before he could finish the book, he was probably killed by someone from the neighboring country to stop him from publishing magic. If magic was published, this magic kingdom would lose their superiority over the other country. That's when the relationship between the two countries worsens. You've got to understand this point. Otherwise, you won't understand who the enemy is. It's hard to know whose side Howl is on. Is he on Suleiman's side or the neighboring country's side? He's attacking almost everybody. That's because he hates the magic kingdom that killed his uncle, and he also hates Suleiman, who tries to control him. So everybody is the enemy. So first, you must know that Hal's uncle died before he could finish writing his magic scroll. Otherwise, you'd be lost. So Howl doesn't like the Magic Kingdom. The king of Howl's country, who never appears, saw the neighboring country as a threat and ordered Suleiman to establish the Magic Academy where Howl studies. Next, the night when the stars fall. The night he makes a contract with the falling star. It's important to remember that Sophie named the star Calcifer. So, when the star falls and they make an agreement to share their hearts, Sophie says, Howl, Calcifer, so that the two can hear. She says, I'm Sophie, I'll see you in the future. Calcifer has already made a contract, so Calcifer hears this too. So there's a cut where Calcifer and Howl look at Sophie. So at that point, Sophie is also included in that contract. That's why he was named Calcifer. And it's depicted quite carefully. You wouldn't understand this if you don't look at it in order. Then, Hal runs away from Suleiman. Suleiman is shocked. You'll see this later, but Hal leaves Suleiman because he has made a contract with Calcifer and gained power. That's how he escapes the academy. Of course, Suleiman tries to stop him, but there is a scene that explains why Suleiman is in the wheelchair later on. When you look at the feud between the two later on, 
you can see that Suleiman was extremely heartbroken. It's easier for you to understand the story when you look at it this way. This Madam Suleiman is also a complex character. When she says to Sophie, how can not stay that way? He's problematic. She hides her face with her stick as she talks. A villain must always hide her face. <laughs> when Suleiman does evil things, she always uses her stick to block the sight of human beings. She might be using some magic to affect Sophie, but above all else, she just looks so cruel. Suleiman is in a wheelchair after the first combat with Howl. 50 years before, a female student ran away from Suleiman and became the witch of the waste. Suleiman creates page boys and turns a man into a dog. So the country begins to put more effort into science research on magic. Next, Hal seduces a witch. He seduces the witch of the waste just for fun and then runs away. He repeats this behavior with many girls. Suleiman attacks a prince and turns him into a scarecrow. I call this the Sarajevo incident because basically this story is about World War I. As the assassination of the prince of Austria led to war, this war in the story is led by Suleiman herself. I guess the prince in the neighboring country was pretty strong. I guess this was one of her operations to neutralize magic by curse. World War I begins. Suleiman tries to take Hal's magic power away from him. When Hal fights, Miyazaki shows the military power of the two nations. You can actually see the soldiers trench fighting. So, you can see the nightmarish battle between the two countries that doesn't seem to end. Howl meets Sophie, guided by the ring. It's hard to recognize it, but... This is where Howl and Sophie met for the first time. When Sophie is trying to get away from the soldier, Howl says, Sorry, have you been waiting long? And you can see the ring flashing red when he wraps his hand around her shoulder. His ring flashes red or blue only when they are calling to each other. So, this is her destiny. Long, long ago, he met a girl who said, I'm Sophie and I'll come and see you again. But he doesn't realize that he finally meets her. He's just picking up a girl as usual. But the ring knows Miyazaki is trying to alert the viewers. So, Howl isn't aware of his own destiny. This is Miyazaki's way of depicting romance, and it's puzzling. A comment just said that it's hard to tell. As you can see in the storyboard, it only says the ring flashes red. I was about to overlook this, but I thought something was wrong. I eventually found out about this rule that the ring only flashes when they are calling to each other. Now, finally we have reached the main story. After the whole story of Hal's moving castle is over, the prince goes back to his own country and Suleiman agrees to surrender. Suleiman says with some dignity, Oh, what can you do? I'll end this stupid war. She looks calm on the surface, but she's the female version of Muska. Although she looks like a plain old lady, she's Muska inside. So, it's the instrument of surrender. Her country is totally burned. In the opening scene, the people are cheering the warship, saying, go and win, but only one warship returns, and it's about to sink. 
It's just like Japan at the very end of World War II, the summer of 1945. That's why she signed the Instrument of Surrender. The nation is bankrupt because of the massive reparations. How went up in the sky because he could no longer do business in his country. It's just like Germany post-World War I. And after a few decades, Suleiman starts another war, World War II. The last scene where after she says, what can you do? I'll end this war. You see the airplanes and you also see House Castle in the air. You may think that the plane is coming home from the war, but when you look down, it's all green below. It can't be green because the whole country was burnt. It's impossible to have farms there. So that means this scene is 10 or 20 years later. Just like Germany, the country that was severely defeated in World War I bounces back and invades the surrounding countries. History repeats itself and in 2005, Suzuki talks about this in an interview published in Saizo magazine. It is the January issue of Saizo. Suzuki is asked by the interviewer, isn't it too soon to end the war like that? Don't you think it's too simple? It's unusual for Suzuki, but he gets really angry and answers the question with a raised voice. He says, didn't you see the planes flying in the last cut? That means another war is beginning. Those planes aren't coming back from the war. They are preparing for war. It's very unusual for him. He explains clearly what the scene meant. Suleiman signs the instrument of surrender and the war ends. But it starts again some decades later. It's hard to know because both Howell and Sophie seem like they haven't aged. So we tend to think that this happened right after. Howell is a wizard so he can change his appearance freely, but Sophie is also a witch. Because Sophie is a witch, she can stay young forever, but in reality, it's after a few decades. When you look at the whole picture, you'll notice that this story is part of an epic. You're looking at this epic story solely from Sophie's point of view. So, it's very experimental, in a way. A comment said, it's hard to tell. Yes, I agree with you. Well, Miyazaki clearly went a bit too far. Honestly, the story lost its balance. They overestimated the viewers. You know, in Spirited Away, many people pointed out the inconsistency. They were more intuitive when they made Spirited Away. But because they didn't like being criticized, the plan was well thought out this time. But they tried not to show it. Although it's all meticulously planned, Miyazaki didn't explain it at all. He was like, you don't need to explain about World War II to tell a love story set in World War II. He was like, it's no problem as long as it's cool. But I think he needs to explain a bit more. Why not explain it after all this planning? Last, Sophie and Hal live happily ever after in the flying castle without aging. The black ribbon proves that she has become a witch. The flying castle in the last scene is the opposite of Raputa. Miyazaki once said that you must go back to the land. But 20 years later he says it's okay to live in the sky. It's about freeing oneself from gravity. So, because gravity makes you old, growing old means aging. When you get old, your body gets heavier and you lose magic power. 
The witch of the waste cannot climb the stairs anymore. The gravity and the aging go hand in hand. You become heavier as you age. Why does this castle fly? Because Miyazaki tried to depict an ultimate happy ending where Howl and Sophie live together in the sky, free from aging. And you cannot miss... The scene where they capture the castle from above. You'll notice something strange. The old lady reading a book, Heen and Marco. Everything looks completely natural, except for this flag. There's an apple tree drawn on it. Well, a tree that looks like an apple tree. And there's quite a deep meaning to it. I thought about it and I figured out pretty soon that this is a pun. Ringoku means neighboring country and Ringo means apple. The prince in the neighboring country who said, I'll eventually come back, lives in this room. Sophie welcomes everyone she likes into her own family. It's a family, so she could have had her own sister or her mother. But instead, she welcomes the people she likes or the people she has kissed into her own family. She's in the midst of happiness where the time has stopped. This is the ultimate happiness for girls. That's the message. And he makes it very subtle. If you show the prince of the neighboring country, it just becomes too graphic. So he shows the flag instead. So I'll end the explanation of the whole structure and plot. Now, this is the end of the first half. We'll talk about this in the second half. But this story is about how being controlled by three witches. Suleiman, Witch of the Waste, and Sophie. I'll explain how Hal was influenced by these three witches. Like I said, this is a story about what happens if Clarice goes on to live with Lupin. It's also similar to Madoka Magica. I'll talk about that. This is the end of the free part. Let's see the result. I had so much information to share with you, and I'm sorry that I had to talk so fast. I assume that you have already seen the film, so that's why, you know, it's always the same, but everybody only sees the surface of the story. Sometimes it's better that way, but you can stumble at certain points because it doesn't make sense. Now the result. Thank you. The second half will be scarier. <laughs> Next week, on August 19th, we'll discuss Osamu Hayashi's theory that you don't need friends. And we welcome any questions, so please submit your questions. On August 26th, we'll discuss My Neighbor Totoro. On September 2nd, we'll talk about rockets. Well, take a look at the life of Von Braun. On September 9th, we'll talk about the book Homo Deus, which will be released soon. And I think it's going to be a huge hit. Our goal is to provide a lecture more worthy than what you pay. I'm going to San Francisco tomorrow, and I go to a place called Disney Family Museum. At the end of the 1980s, the Disney family was kicked out of the company so that Disney wouldn't go bankrupt. So they were angry and took all the relics of Walt Disney and Roy Disney and made this family museum near the bay in San Francisco. And it's pretty deep. I'm going there for work, so I'll tell you about it soon. Let's switch. Thank you for watching until the end. I am the most famous 
オタクキングインジャパンオタキングトシオオカダ。I started planning to talk overseas about animations and movies popular in Japan in English. Before long, I'm planning to add English subtitles to movie talking in Japanese. So please look forward to it. If you ask a, a question in this comment field of this video, maybe I will talk about comments as a theme. We welcome the people who are interested in the forefront of Japanese otaku culture and those who want to hear stories of interesting animations and movies. So please sub subscribe our channel. If there is good relation, I will get better and I will do my best. <laughs> Thanks.